with Knox Presbyterian Church in Bracebridge on this Sunday, October the 24th, as we gather together in person and online to worship God this day. Well, there are a few announcements that I would like to share with you, and the first one is quite exciting. The session has found the person who will serve as our worship media coordinator, and her name is Crystal Ilchinia, and she will be joining us in November. And Crystal will be responsible for preparing and recording the video elements that enhance our worship services. And she will also be recording and uploading our weekly Sunday worship service once the new camera arrives, which I have been assured once again will be soon. So we welcome Crystal and I look forward to the opportunity to introducing her to you when that time comes. We would also like to extend a huge thanks to Paul and Ingrid Van Scandal for organizing the mountain moving event that took place this past week. On Tuesday, we had a mountain of topsoil delivered here at the church, and Paul and Ingrid organized a happy crew of volunteers who moved that mountain and filled our raised bed gardens to be ready for the planting season next year. And on Facebook, Ingrid put, here at Knox, we can move mountains when we work together, and the crew on Tuesday is proof of that. And I'd also like to thank Michael Barnes and Betty Harris, who donated the wood for this project. 
Also to let you know that next Sunday, October 31st, is Reformation Sunday, and there is still a little bit of time for you to let me know your hymns or your uh, church music that you would like to dedicate in honor of or in memory of a loved one. And we've had a great response so far, so I think we will be singing some of your requested songs for more than just one week, perhaps two or even three weeks. Also, as most of you know, we have partnered with the United Church here in town to work towards sponsoring a Syrian refugee family, the John Bali family. And we have a couple of fundraisers that have kicked off this week to help in this process. One of them is a scrap metal fundraiser. So we have a big bin located at the back of our parking lot, and it is already half full of scrap metal. I think we might have to get it dumped and brought back again because it's only been in place for a few days. It will be in place until November 19th. So if you have any scrap metal lying around and you want to get rid of it, this is the place to bring it and you can turn your metal into money for our refugee project. And we also have another fundraiser taking place. These items were just dropped off here at the church this past week. Chocolate bars from Peace by Chocolate and the book Peace by Chocolate, which tells the Haddad's family's story, their journey from Syria to Canada, where they produce now in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, these chocolate bars. So you can stop by the church and get a sweet chocolate bar or an interesting book to read. And again, you will be supporting the Refugee Sponsorship, sponsorship Program. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I invite you to join with me for our responsive call to worship. The words will appear on your screen. Come, take refuge in this place and this time, for God meets us here. From the storms and struggles of life, we come. Come, rejoice in this place and time, for God provides peace for us here. From fear and anxiety, we come to find peace. Come, open your hearts to the prompting of God's Spirit, which guides us in love, justice, and peace. Amen. Please join with me now in prayer, which will be followed by the Lord's Prayer in unison. This is the day that you have made, Creator God, and we rejoice and are very glad in it. We gather in this place and in our homes, setting aside this time to be still, to reflect, and to respond to your call to live out lives of faith, lives that seek to reflect your grace and mercy to others. May this time together serve to encourage and enliven us, especially as we travel through this challenging pandemic time, and help us to sense your prompting and guidance so that we may leave this time of worship with a better understanding of how we can be reflections of you in practical and helpful ways. Bless our time together. We ask, uniting our voices with the prayer Jesus taught, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we will now join together for the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
One thing that I love to do at this time of year is to collect leaves from outside that have fallen to the ground, and we have a ton of them in our yard, and then to iron them between two pieces of wax paper. I love the scent when the hot iron hits the dry, crispy leaves. And I also love the fact that the wax preserves the leaves so that we can enjoy them for a little bit longer. Well, autumn is a time of transition, and these leaves perfectly symbolize transition. They are only with us for a short time, beginning as healthy green leaves attached to their branches throughout the summer, but then their colors change and they become radiant things of beauty, but only for a short time, for a few weeks if we're lucky, before falling to the ground where then they soon wither and dry up. And according to the Ontario Fall Color Report, which I checked just the other day, the leaves in Bracebridge are at 80 to 90% of their peak, but over 60% of them have already fallen to the ground. So it is indeed a short season. But we know that after the snow blankets the leaves in winter and then melts again in the springtime, the process will repeat itself. New leaves will soon bud on the trees and the cycle will begin again. And there is hope in that cycle that we are witnessing right outside our very windows. This time of transition that is symbolized by the falling leaves reminds us that when we are going through times of transition, it is for a season. And that season, whether it is a positive one or whether it is a challenging one, will come to an end. But then another season will begin. So if you are finding things particularly challenging right now, maybe school is not going the way you had hoped or you're really just getting sick and tired of wearing a mask and following the COVID protocols, hang in there because a new season is coming. And we don't know what that new season will bring. We can be pretty sure that it will in fact have challenges, but we can also be sure that it will also contain joy. So enjoy the beautiful autumn leaves before they wither up and die. Perhaps iron a few between a couple of sheets of wax paper so you can enjoy them for a little bit longer as a reminder that God can be found in the changing seasons with all of their challenges and also with all of their joys. Let's pray together. God, sometimes change is difficult. We like the predictability that comes when things stay the same, but we know that things rarely stay the same, especially during this pandemic time. The leaves of autumn remind us life is filled with times of transition. One season changes and another is about to begin. And like these autumn leaves, help us to find beauty in the midst of change. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a song in every song 
chapter and the first six verses and then the seventh verse to the uh, uh, the tenth verse sorry, to the end of the chapter then Job answered the Lord I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted who is this that hides counsel without knowledge therefore I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you declare to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Kelenhapanch. In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations, and Job died old and full of days. We are all familiar with stories that begin with once upon a time and conclude with and they lived happily ever after. So once upon a time, there was a princess named Snow White. Her stepmother, the queen, was jealous of Snow White's beauty, yada, yada, yada. Together, the prince and Snow White rode off to his castle where they lived happily ever after. Or, once upon a time, in a faraway kingdom, there lived a widowed gentleman and his lovely daughter, Ella, also known as Cinderella. Yada, yada, yada. Cinderella and the prince, along with all of her animal friends, lived happily ever after. Well, we are content, and all seems right in the world when our stories end with, and they lived happily ever after. But many of us know of stories, and some of us might even be living them, where that isn't the case. We don't live happily ever after. Instead, the story ends in sorrow, loss, or despair. So what do we do with those stories? How do we respond when our story does not have a fairy tale ending? Well, today we look at the conclusion of the story of Job, the last chapter, which we could argue does have a fairy tale ending, a happily ever after, but it's an ending that seems out of place. 
And perhaps there might be some guidance for us when we are looking for fairy tale endings, happily ever afters, when there simply are none. Well, last week we spoke of the trials of Job, who faced unimaginable loss and grief. Everything he owned, everything he loved, had been taken away from him as part of a challenge of sorts between God and Satan. And we remember that this is a parable, and the parable begins in chapter 1 with God and Satan speaking about Job's righteousness and faith. Satan contends that Job is only righteous and faithful because God has blessed him richly with family, fortune, and prestige. And so to prove his case, all of Job's blessings are taken away. His possessions are destroyed, his children are killed, and Job himself is plagued with painful sores all over his body. And Satan is sure that Job is going to renounce his faith in God as a result. Well, last week we compared Job's trials to a whirlwind, and we spoke about how for 37 chapters Job and his three friends tried to figure out why. Why was Job thrust into this whirlwind? What did he do? How did he sin? How did he offend God so much that God would create such chaos in his life? And Job's friends are convinced that the whirlwind is caused by something that Job has done to offend God. But Job insists that he has done absolutely nothing wrong. And I think there are times, if we are honest with ourselves, when we might agree with those three friends of Job, when we approach our own challenges in life, we ask ourselves, what did I do to deserve this? Why is God punishing me this way? If we haven't said similar statements ourselves, we definitely have heard those statements from others. At some level, we still may be tempted to think of a cosmic God who punishes us with trials when we are bad and rewards us with blessings when we are good. And there's an entire theology that is based on that concept. It's called the prosperity gospel with the belief that if we live good Christian lives, attending church, donating to charity, reading our Bibles and praying regularly, then God will bless us with material wealth. That new car is a blessing from God because we've been attending church regularly or watching it online. That clean bill of health from the doctor is God blessing us because we donated so much of our income to charity. That string of green lights on the way to work is God blessing us for our faith and dedication. That's according to the prosperity gospel, but it works conversely as well. If you are struggling financially, well, it's because you didn't have enough faith. If you get bad news from the doctor, well, you must have missed a few weeks of church. Job's three friends would have fit right in to this prosperity gospel theology. They were convinced that Job must have done something wrong to cause all of his chaos and that God was punishing him. While Job was convinced that he had done nothing wrong, his faith in God remained intact, but his understanding of God was questionable. And in last week's passage, God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind of chaos and despair to put things back into perspective, reminding Job that he is but one speck within the marvelous, unexplainable vastness of creation. But he is a speck that is understood, that is heard, and that is loved. And in today's passage, Job responds to that, admitting his foolishness in trying to understand the mind and motives of God, confessing in verse 3, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Now, if the story ended there, I think we would be content with that. Job admits that there are some things in life that are simply 
unexplainable. Sometimes bad things do happen to good people and good things do happen to bad people and we simply don't know why. People are not blessed with riches and good health because of their faith and they are not punished with poverty and poor health due to their lack of faith. Job is a prime example of that. He maintained his faith in the midst of the whirlwind. But the story doesn't end there. And it would seem that everything the story of Job teaches us about faith and blessing is completely unraveled in verses 10 to 17. It's almost like Satan was right in his cosmic conversation with God in chapter one, when he contends that Job's relationship with God does depend on God's blessing. We read in verse 10, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. That sounds an awful lot like a reward for good faith. So what is up with that? We have just seen Job conclude that his faith was not dependent upon God's blessings. And then we read that God blessed Job with twice as much as he had before because he prayed for his friends because of his faith. Well, the followers of the prosperity gospel would be quite pleased with that. And I've actually read from some scholars who believe that these last concluding verses were likely tacked on to the original text at a later date by some editor who was upset with the ambiguous ending who couldn't handle being left with more questions than answers, and who is seeking a tidy, happily ever after ending. But when we really look at it, is it truly a happy ending? Perhaps a better description of this ending is one that is bittersweet ever after, not happily ever after. Getting a new family does not replace the family that Job has lost. Anyone who has faced the death of a family member, a child or a spouse, for example, knows perfectly well that a new spouse or a new child never replaces the one we have lost. We love them deeply and they bring us much joy and fulfillment, but the new family member does not erase the memory of what has come before. And perhaps the bittersweet ending of Job is more realistic than the happily ever after ending we hope for. Job discovers that he is able to live again after surviving the whirlwind of chaos and despair. He is even able to find joy again. And when you think about it, living again after a time of unspeakable pain is truly like resurrection. Discovering a new life, discovering a new way of living, a new way of being after having been shaped and molded by the pain of a previous season. The final verses of the parable of Job indicate that Job has indeed been changed by his time in the whirlwind. He gets up from his ash heap of sorrow and loss to get on with his life. And we soon see that his life has been changed by his deepened understanding of God. So we read how Job's fortunes are restored, indeed doubled in verses 10 to 17. But the author of this parable brings attention to an interesting aspect of Job's new life and his new purpose. And I think it's quite intentional that the author ensures that the names of Job's daughters are preserved, along with a little detail about how they are treated by Job. So Job's son's names remain a mystery, but we read that his daughters are named Jemima, which means dove, Keziah, which means cinnamon, and Karen Hapuch, which means child of beauty. 
And these beautifully named daughters receive an inheritance from Job along with Job's sons, something that was simply unheard of at this time and in this place. It would seem that Job's encounter with God in the whirlwind, in the midst of his chaos and despair, has not only deepened Job's understanding of God, but it has also deepened his understanding of how he is to live as a child of God. Yes, he has been blessed, but now he extends that blessing to others, specifically to his daughters who would have been left out of the inheritance at this time, at this place in history. Job utters a profound statement of faith as he steps out of his whirlwind of chaos and despair, proclaiming in verse 5, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. So prior to his time in the whirlwind, Job knew of God from the instruction of others, from his upbringing, his traditions, his family, and his faith community. But now Job meets God in his own life, in the thick of the storm, in the midst of the whirlwind, and in the calm of the aftermath. He's able to recognize God's presence in the times of chaos, as well as in the time of blessing. In the minutia of his own existence, which he does understand, as well as in the vastness of creation, which he does not understand. And in recognizing God, he also recognizes how he is to live as a child of God, being a blessing to others, seeking justice and peace, living in harmony with others and with creation. And it would seem that this recognition of who God is and how we are to live as children of God does not depend on a happily ever after ending after all. In fact, it is perhaps more evident in the bittersweet discovery of joy after sorrow, love after loss, and hope after despair. And perhaps that is a happily ever after ending after all. Amen.
invite you to join with me now for the prayers of the people. The autumn leaves falling from the trees remind us that life is filled with seasons. Seasons of joy, but also seasons of challenge. God, the parable of Job illustrates that bittersweet joy can be found after our whirlwinds of chaos and despair. As we continue to travel through the challenge of this pandemic, while also facing our own personal challenges, we remember that this too is a season, although it may be a very long one, and a new season is coming. May we take what we learn through this season to create a world that is a little more just, a little more hope-filled, and a little more equitable for all your people. The injustice in our world causes us so much pain, and so we join our thoughts and intentions in praying for solutions. We pray for the people of Iqaluit, who are under a state of emergency as their water supply has been contaminated. The community is now being forced to medevac patients out of the territory as its only hospital suffers the effects of the water contamination crisis. We pray for those facing water crises in other areas. Floods are causing chaos in India and Nepal, while Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Madagascar, and parts of the U.S., Mexico, and Yemen have drought or only access to contaminated water. We pray for parts of the world where the rights to free speech, health care, human rights, and freedoms are limited or non-existent. And we especially think of the plight of those in Afghanistan, China, Eritrea, Hong Kong, Myanmar, the Philippines, Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, Syria, and Somalia. The season of distress seems to be a very long one in these regions. So help us to use our voices and our influence to bring about change, however small we might think it to be. We pray for refugees around the world and specifically for the John Bali family who have fled Syria and are now seeking refuge in Iraq. Guide us as we partner with the United Church to bring the John Bali's to safety in Canada, but help us not to neglect others who are also in need. And God, we are thankful in the midst of this whirlwind for opportunities to respond to the food insecurity issue in our community through our emergency food box program and our future community gardens. Thank you for the volunteers that are passionate about this cause and use this blessing of ours to be a blessing to others. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go forth now to bring hope to a world that is hurting, to work for justice for all who are oppressed, and to share love with those who are feeling lost or alone. And do so knowing that the God of hope, justice, and love is walking with you and working through you, bringing you peace for today and hope for tomorrow. Amen.